our bodies need many different nutrients in order to survive. In terms of nutrition, we break these down into two broad groups, the macronutrients and the micronutrients. Macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and water are things that our bodies need on a daily basis in a relatively high abundance. On the other hand, the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, are things that our bodies still require on a daily basis, but in significantly lower amounts. In this video, we're going to focus on the vitamins. Vitamins are substances that are needed by our bodies on a daily basis in order to function properly, and we typically divide these into two classes, water-soluble vitamins and fat-soluble vitamins. In this video, we'll learn about what these different vitamins do in order to help our bodies survive in the amounts that we need on a daily basis in order for our bodies to function properly. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're gonna be talking about one of the classes of micronutrients known as vitamins. Now, vitamins come in two major varieties, the fat-soluble versions and the water-soluble versions. Fat-soluble vi vitamins include vitamins A, D, E, and K, whereas the water-soluble vitamins are vitamin C and the B vitamins. In this video, we'll talk about the different types of vitamins, why our body needs them, and how much we actually need and what functions they perform inside of the body. Now, one major difference between uh, these two groups has to do with how our bodies absorb them. Uh, all of these vitamins are going to be absorbed in the small intestine, but the difference is um, what our body has to do in order to absorb them properly. Water-soluble vitamins, the B vitamins and vitamin C, are fairly easily absorbed by the intestine because they are soluble in water, so they just simply get absorbed uh, through the intestinal cells into the bloodstream and enter circulation that way. On the other hand, vitamins A, D, E, and K, the fat-soluble vitamins, these are going to be absorbed not much differently than phospholipids and fats are. So they're going to be um, solubilized into mesels. These mesels are going to be absorbed by the small intestine. Uh, they're going to be repackaged into chylomicrons, enter the lymphatic system, eventually make it to the liver. And then the liver can uh, sort of hold on to these and then release them into the body as they are needed. One big thing to note about this is just like fats and other lipids, um, your body actually needs fats around in order to absorb these vitamins. So uh, what that means is that if you're taking in the fat-soluble vitamins in, in a sort of low-fat context, you may not be absorbing all of the different uh, vitamins that you actually need. Some of them may not be being absorbed simply because the fats aren't around to form the me cells and the chylomicrons that are needed for the absorption and then the trafficking of these vitamins into the liver. We don't have that problem with water-soluble vitamins because they simply go through the small intestine and enter the circulation that way. So we're gonna start with vitamin A, and vitamin A are typically referred to as retinoids. Now, retinoids are typically absorbed um, from our diet either from animal sources in the forms of retinol, with an O, and in the form of carotenoids. So these are things like carotene and xanthophils from plant sources. Now, once they get in the body, they actually need to be converted into inactive, uh, into one of two active forms, and these are retinal, with an A, uh, or retinoic acid. Now, uh, retinol from animal sources is fairly easily converted by your body into retinal or retinoic acid into the usable form. On the other hand, um, many carotenes um, and xanthophils, uh, these are a little bit more challenging for your body to actually convert into a biologically active form, and sometimes they actually remain in our body um, either as, as a carotenoid and get utilized that way. So the best sources of vitamin A are gonna come from animal sources simply because um, they're more easy for your body to convert. And some of the plant sources, the carotenoids can't even be converted into retinol or, or retinol or retinoic acid, um, even if your body wanted to. Nevertheless, they're all still useful. So uh, ret vitamin A is particularly important uh, for vision, um, hence the term retinoids. They're involved particularly in the function of your retina. And people who are deficient in vitamin A often, uh, one of the major symptoms is um, uh, difficulty seeing, particularly at night. So night vision can be particularly, um, particularly affected by this. Vitamin A is also important for your immune system function. And correspondingly, people who are low in vitamin A often are more likely to become ill than those that don't. Now, what we have found with vitamin A supplementation in some cases is that vitamin A is not likely to increase 
necessarily or decrease the incidence of someone actually getting ill. On the other hand, it does seem to have some effect on reducing the severity of the illness. Now, again, this doesn't mean that taking huge amounts of vitamin A as a supplement is going to prevent you from getting sick or lessen the disease at all. This is typically found in patients who have other issues, um, particularly in vitamin A deficiencies. So it does appear that getting a significant amount of vitamin A is important for your body's immune system's ability to fend off infections, not necessarily prevent you from getting ill, but shorten the duration or lessen the severity of the illness. Vitamin A is also important for growth and development, um, particularly for that for the eyes and for the ears um, and, and the brain. So one of the things that has been noted in uh, vitamin A deficient babies is there is a significantly higher incidence of vision and hearing problems. Um, there also has been some link to uh, growth retardation, although this is a bit challenging uh, because there are often confounding variables. They typically aren't simply deficient in vitamin A. They're often de deficient in several other vitamins due to a poor diet. So it's difficult to say whether it's specifically vitamin a that's leading to this symptom um, or whether it's a combination of vitamin a and other issues vitamin a toxicity is not really a problem it's incredible incredibly rare to happen so vitamin a toxicity would occur if somebody is taking in too much vitamin a as i said um, there really don't appear to be any significant signs or symptoms associated with this and over you know taking an excessive amount of vitamin a to the point where it would cause any effects um, is incredibly rare so how do we get vitamin A in our diet? There are two major sources. As I said, animal sources, vitamin A is abundant uh, within them. And uh, our body is better able to utilize the vitamin A that's coming from these sources and convert them into the biologically active forms in our body. You can also get vitamin A from brightly colored foods, uh, or fruits and, and, and plants, uh, fruits and vegetables. Why? Because these colorations are the carotenoids. These are the pigments, um, the carotenes and the xanthophils that give fruits their color. And these are the things that our body can sometimes convert into biologically active forms. Um, but our body has a significantly harder time doing that. Because there are differences in our body's ability to utilize different sources of vitamin A in our diet, uh, when we talk about the recommended daily amounts of, of what you should consume for vitamin A, we have to convert it into something called retinol activity equivalents. Um, in other words, like how much retinol activity we actually get out of that food and it's source dependent. So for example, um, if we're taking in one international unit of uh, retinol from an animal source, that's equivalent to like 0.3 micrograms of, 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 an RE, uh, of an REA or an RAE, retinol activity equivalent. On the other hand, if you're getting it from plants, uh, the same amount is, is actually only 0.05 micrograms um, RAE uh, because of our body's ability to, to activate the forms from plants compared to those from animal sources. And you can see here on this chart um, exactly how much uh, different age groups should actually be getting um, in terms of their vitamin A on a daily basis. Next, we'll turn our attention to vitamin D. So vitamin D is actually a cluster of of related uh, vitamins with similar chemical structures. It turns out that there are actually only two um, really biologically active forms of vitamin D that are useful in our bodies, vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 is more, uh, more technically known as ergocalciferol, uh, while as vitamin D3 is known as calcitriol. Uh, these two are actually synthesized largely by your skin. So about 90% of the vitamin D that you're going to get on a daily basis actually comes from your skin's exposure to sunlight. And unless you think I'm saying that you have to go outside and stay in the sun for hours in order to get a proper amount of vitamin D, you actually don't. So it turns out in just about 30 minutes exposure to sunlight, your body will generate something like 10,000 international units of, of vitamin D if you had gotten that through your diet. And yes, you can get vitamin D through your diet. Some people get it through supplementation, particularly those that live um, in uh, extremely northern, extremely southern latitudes. In the winter, um, vitamin D can be scarce. Why? Because we typically don't go outside as much. And when we do go outside, we're, high, we're heavily covered up because it's so cold during the winter months. And as a result, reduced exposure to that sunlight reduces our body's native production of vitamin D. So you can acquire it through supplements. You can also acquire it through your diet. Regardless of how you get your vitamin D, whether you acquire it through your diet or it's produced through your skin, it's actually produced or ingested in an inactive form. That inactive form has to go through your liver and then through your kidneys in order to be converted into an active form. So what does active vitamin D do for our body? Well, it turns out that vitamin D is extremely important for calcium homeostasis. Um, and one of the major sources of calcium inside of your body is your bones. 
So um, in the absence of vitamin D3, your body has a hard time regulating how much of the calcium should remain in your bones and how much of it should be reabsorbed in an effort to maintain calcium homeostasis throughout your entire body. In fact, in the absence of sufficient amounts of vitamin D, less than 15% of the calcium that your body ingests is actually absorbed by the body and the rest of it is just eliminated. As a result, you can imagine that decreases in vitamin D um, can have significant problems in terms of bone health, and they can. Uh, vitamin D deficiency in childhood could lead to a, uh, lead to a, uh, a disease known as rickets. So rickets uh, presents as pe people, these children will have malformed or soft bones, simply because calcium acts as a hardening agent uh, to sort of calcify and strengthen their bones. In adults, insufficiency in D3 can lead to a couple other bone problems, notably um, osteoporosis, which is a hardening and in, uh, in, in, in transition into a brittle state of the bones, which makes them very easy to break and can be very problematic. And another form of softening of the bones, uh, which is similar to rickets. So in addition to maintaining proper bone health, what are the other advantages to maintaining uh, high levels of vitamin D? Well, it turns out that in addition to helping fend off things like osteoporosis and, and other bone related diseases, it also helps to keep our immune system functioning properly. Um, and it can also reduce the risk of developing certain autoimmune diseases. These have all been linked uh, through um, scientific research and observational studies. So where do we get vitamin D? Well, as I said, um, 30 minutes or so a day of exposure to Sunlight is typically enough to keep your vitamin D levels relatively where you need them to be uh, to produce a sufficient amount of vitamin D in order for your body to function properly. But what do you do if you um, can't get the necessary sunlight for whatever reason? Uh, well, we can supplement these things. So you can take vitamin D supplements um, and your body can readily take in that vitamin D uh, to maintain normal levels. You can also acquire it from certain foods. So things like fish, poultry, other meat products um, are are and eggs are actually uh, quite full of vitamin D and very helpful there. Um, other sources include fortified foods. So um, milk, for example, is often fortified with vitamin D. Orange juice um, can also be found fortified with vitamin D as well. Vitamin D, just like vitamin A, toxicity is exceedingly rare and almost never observed because you would have to consume so much vitamin D um, that it would, it would be very challenging to do so. You would probably have to take just an excessive amount of supplemented vitamin D in order to do so. How much do you need? Well, it turns out for people from ages one to 70, uh, you need about 15 micrograms per day. On the other hand, if you are over 70, they're gonna up that to 20 micrograms per day. The next fat soluble vitamin we'll discuss is vitamin E. So vitamin E, there are actually eight different forms of vitamin E, but one called alpha tocopherol appears to be the only one with um, biological activity. So the other seven don't really seem to be functioning to, to do what our bodies need them to do. So what does vitamin E do for us? So vitamin E is actually a very important antioxidant. So antioxidants are these substances which are able to detoxify systems of things called free radicals. And free radicals are things that have like an extra electron attached to them, which makes them super reactive. The problem with free radicals and biological systems is they can actually interact with the phospholipids that make up biological membranes, destroying those phospholipids and weakening the cells by damaging the plasma membrane. Vitamin E actually is, again, a fat-soluble substance, so it's hydrophobic. It actually can integrate itself into biological membranes. And there, it actually sort of absorbs that, that, anti, that, that free radical blow that the cells might be taking, and, and itself actually acts to detoxify these free radicals. The downside to this is once active uh, vitamin E interacts with a free radical, it's, it's permanently altered, which means it can only be used once, and then it either has to be recycled some of which actually occurs through the activity of vitamin C, um, but the majority of it is actually just gonna be removed from the body. What that means is you have to have a constant input of vitamin E to maintain normal healthy levels of vitamin D in your diet. Vitamin E also plays an important role in the immune system. One thing that has been noted is that vitamin E appears to be uh, very important for the activity of T cells. So T cells are a group of immune cells that have very important roles um, in terms of fighting off uh, bacterial and, and, and viral infections. And it's been found that people who are deficient in vitamin E are significantly more susceptible to, um, to contracting and getting um, 
having negative side effects associated with both bacterial and viral infections. And it has indeed been found that, particularly in older individuals, supplementing with vitamin E can help to shorten the duration or lessen the severity of various illnesses. So where are you getting your vitamin E? Well, vitamin E is actually very easily obtained in high abundance from uh, nuts and seeds. Uh, it's found uh, in very high levels in those things. And eating even a small amount of those can typically get your vitamin E uh, requirements for the day. How much do you actually need? Well, in children, it varies from about four to 11 milligrams. It varies with age. So the younger you are, uh, the less you need. The older you are, the more you need. In adults, uh, we want you to be getting 15 milligrams per day of vitamin E. The last group of fat soluble vitamins are vitamin K. So vitamin K are actually cofactors that are involved in your blood and also play a role in bone health. So vitamin K is essential for blood clotting. So what that means is when you're injured um, or when there's a wound, your blood needs to uh, be able to form these clots in order to stop the bleeding from happening. And in the absence of vitamin K, your body doesn't appear to have the ability to do that very well. As, as you would expect, then people who are deficient in vitamin K um, often have difficulties clotting blood, which means they could bleed excessively when they're injured. They may also develop, um, you know, bleeding um, like nosebleeds or bleeding internally from their capillaries uh, because their body is unable to clot the blood like they're supposed to. We also know that vitamin K is important for bone remodeling. So um, as weird as that sounds, your bones have to constantly be changing over time and it has to do with things like calcium absorption and and, and, and the like. Vitamin K is important because it interacts with a very specific protein that is important for bone remodeling called osteocalcin. Um, and vitamin K, without being able to function as that cofactor for osteocalcin, uh, doesn't function appropriately. So where should you be getting your vitamin K and how much should you be getting? Vitamin K is found in highest abundance in green vegetables, broccoli, spinach, cabbage, asparagus. Uh, foods like that are packed full of vitamin K. How much should you be getting? Well, it depends. Uh, throughout childhood, um, it's going to increase from about 30 micrograms a day up to 75 micrograms per day. In adulthood, adult males should be getting about 120 micrograms of vitamin K per day, whereas adult women should be getting about 90 micrograms of vitamin K per day. So now we'll move on to the water soluble vitamins, vitamin C and then the B vitamins. We're gonna start with vitamin C because there are lots of B vitamins that uh, we're gonna go through individually in just a minute. So we'll start with the simple one, vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid. So vitamin C um, is important for several different processes in your body. As I mentioned before, vitamin C actually does function as an antioxidant. Why? Because it's actually able to absorb electrons, not unlike vitamin E. Vitamin C is also very important for the recycling of vitamin E. As I mentioned, when vitamin E interacts with a free radical, um, it gets modified and can no longer function as an antioxidant. Vitamin C has the ability to help recycle some of that vitamin E, put it back into its active form. And together, vitamin C and vitamin E are very important antioxidants from keeping your body from being harmed from the free radicals. This is also very important given the fact that our body naturally produces some of these free radicals as part of our metabolism. Vitamin C is important for a lot of other things in your body in addition to being an antioxidant. It's important for the production of certain hormones. It's important for the activity of certain enzymes as well as the production of certain amino acids. But perhaps one of the most important roles it plays in your body is functioning in the structure of collagen fibers. So collagen is actually the most abundant protein in your body. It makes up your tendons. It makes up your ligaments. It makes up um, it helps to hold your skin and your tissues together. And obviously in the absence of collagen, these things can be uh, can stop functioning the way they ought to. The definition or the technical term for the for vitamin C deficiency is known as scurvy, and you may have heard it in the context with sailors and pirates and that type of stuff. And the reason why is uh, early sailors, when they were sailing the world, would not get enough vitamin C in their diet, and as the result, they would often develop scurvy as a side effect. This is actually why British sailors used to bring bags of limes with them um, on ships to prevent them from developing uh, because limes are a, and other citrus fruits are a great source of vitamin C, this would prevent them from developing scurvy on their long journeys. And it's also why you get the term limey to describe British sailors. Scurvy, as you would expect, has, to, has a lot to do um, with the inability of vitamin C deficient people to form proper collagen fibers. So collagen has to be held together to make these long fibers, to make up things like tendons and ligaments. Vitamin C actually acts as the glue that holds these fibers together. And when you don't have enough of the glue, the fibers aren't very strong. As a result, with scurvy, you get um, painful joints. But you also get deterioration in other tissues. So you get things like skin defects, 
bleeding gums. Um, you can actually become significantly more susceptible to certain infections and eventually you could actually die as a result of all of these things working in conjunction. So it's very important to get vitamin C in our diet. What's very interesting is we seem to have lost the ability to produce vitamin C through evolution. Most mammals are actually able to synthesize their own vitamin C as part of their metabolism. On the other hand, humans, as well as several other primates, cannot, and we can trace that back to the evolution of something called a pseudogene. Basically, one of the enzymes needed to produce vitamin C in our bodies no longer functions properly as a result of evolution. That's a whole other conversation for another day. What that means is you need to get an adequate amount of vitamin C in your diet on a regular basis. So where do you get vitamin C from? Well, as I said before, vitamin C is abundant in numerous citrus fruits um, and the juices associated with them, so things like orange juice, but you can also get it from like things like lemons and from limes. You can also get it from a host of green vegetables. Um, so consuming an adequate amount of vitamin C in your diet is very important since your body can no longer synthesize it. So how much vitamin C do you need on a daily basis? Well, there's a bit of a strange pattern for this. For infants, we want them to be getting between 40 and 50 milligrams per day. Then throughout childhood, it actually varies from about 15 milligrams per day starting um, at one year old and then moving back up through about 45 uh, towards the end of childhood. In adults, we want you to be getting somewhere around 75 milligrams of vitamin C per day at minimum. Now, one big thing that about vitamin C is sort of uh, in society is that somehow there is a link between um, people consuming vitamin C and a decrease in um, infection rates or, or in the severity of an illness. After 50 years of very intense research, there is zero conclusive evidence that vitamin C in low doses or in extremely high doses has any effect on the severity of an illness or preventing you from getting an illness. Nevertheless, people still continue to take mega doses of vitamin C uh, in order to help to fend off infections or decrease the severity of this. But to be clear, again, 50 years of research, there is not a single piece of evidence uh, that vitamin C actually can reduce the severity of illnesses uh, to any major extent. That being said, toxicity of vitamin C, there doesn't appear to be any really major side effects with it, with the exception of maybe some diarrhea or some gastrointestinal discomfort associated with taking extremely high doses of vitamin C. So chances are, if you're taking a lot of vitamin C to help fend off your cold or your flu or whatever, um, you're probably not hurting yourself, but you're probably not also, you're probably not having any major effect from that either. So now we're moving on to the B vitamins, and there are a lot of them. Uh, vitamin B1, also known as thiamine, is very important for um, metabolism. So uh, without proper amounts of, of vitamin B1, uh, your body is unable to perform glycolysis or the Krebs cycle very efficiently. Um, it's also important for the, uh, for the production of various proteins, RNA, DNA, ATP, as well as various neurotransmitters. So as a result, you can imagine that a deficiency in vitamin B1 is problematic, and the term for this is known as beriberi. So beriberi has a host of symptoms, confusion, uh, painful muscle, uh, painful muscle uh, movements, fatigue, um, painful joints, swelling of the extremities, and then actually can lead to heart failure um, in extreme circumstances. So it's very important to get a certain, a, a, a sufficient amount of vitamin B1 in your diet. So how much do you actually need? Well, in children, about 0.9 milligrams of vitamin B1 in, per day is a sufficient amount. In adulthood, it's around 1.1 or 1.2 milligrams per day. This is what you're gonna wanna take in um, uh, of vitamin B1. So where are you gonna get it? Well, vitamin B1 is very abundant in things like whole grains. You can also get it from um, certain meat products, fish, for example. Um, you can find a sufficient amount of vitamin B1 from those sources. Moving on to vitamin B2, also known as riboflavin. So riboflavin is involved in protein, carbohydrate, and lipid metabolism. Um, it's also important for the function of some other B vitamins, including folate and vitamin B6, which can't be activated or perform their necessary biological functions except in the presence of riboflavin. Now, riboflavin, you may actually notice in your urine. So riboflavin has this thing called a flavin ring as part of its chemical structure. And this flavin ring actually has a yellow color. So if you notice a bright yellow coloration of your urine, you probably consumed an excess amount of vitamin B2 that day, um, and your body is removing it that way in, uh, through your urine, hence the bright yellow coloration from the flavin ring of that particular molecule. 
So what happens if you don't get enough riboflavin? Well, riboflavin deficiency is kind of rare, but it's more common in people suffering from alcoholism. Um, people with uh, riboflavin deficiencies uh, usually have uh, cracked lips, dry, scaly skin. Uh, these are some of the more common symptoms of, of riboflavin deficiency. Um, but it's fairly easy to get a sufficient amount of riboflavin in your diet. There are a lot of different foods there, uh, which it's available. It's fortified in a lot of cereals and grains. You can get it from things like milk. Actually, um, one of the reasons why dairy products are typically kept in um, sort of cloudy or obscured um, light proof containers like milk um, and milk jugs is because riboflavin is photosensitive. So exposure to light can actually degrade the riboflavin in there and remove that nutrient from your food. Milk actually used to be delivered in glass bottles, but nowadays when you go to the store, it's typically in sort of white containers or darkly colored containers to prevent the, from the riboflavin from being destroyed by exposure to sunlight and other forms of light. Same thing with yogurt and other dairy products that contain riboflavin. Vitamin B3, also known as niacin, uh, is the next B vitamin that we'll talk about. So uh, niacin is actually an important component of two biological molecules, NADH and NADPH. Um, these molecules function as electron carriers, um, which are essential for, most, for many major metabolic pathways in your body. If you recall, um, one of my previous videos, uh, we had a conversation about metabolism more specifically cellular respiration. And what you may have recalled is that a lot of what happens in um, our catabolic pathways is the removal of electrons from food sources to be utilized for electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. NADH and NADPH are two of the major electron carriers that help to remove electrons and shuttle them back and forth between places in the body. In the absence of niacin, this can't happen. Vitamin B3 deficiency is known as pellagra. And as you would expect, when you're deficient in something so important for your energetic pathways, uh, people that suffer from pellagra um, often su suffer from fatigue, um, lack of appetite, weight loss. And then it's followed by what are known as the four Ds, um, diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death in some cases. So an inability to acquire enough niacin in your diet is actually potentially fatal um, as, as a result of your body not being able to perform proper cellular metabolism. So where do you get niacin? Well, niacin is readily available in meat, fish, and various grain products um, that you consume as part of your diet. Um, how much should you get? Well, for children, it's between 6 and 12 milligrams per day, depending on age. For adults, we like 14 to 16 milligrams per day uh, in order to maintain a healthy amount of this particular vitamin in your body. Vitamin B5, also known as pantothenic acid, is the next B vitamin that we'll talk about. So. Um, Vitamin B5 is really important uh, because it helps, to, it helps to form something known as coenzyme A. And coenzyme A is essential for the metabolism of pretty much every single um, food source in your body. If, again, you think back to what, uh, one of my previous videos about cellular respiration, one of the things that's going to happen, whether you're processing carbohydrates, fats, or proteins, is you're going to lead to a production of, of a molecule known as acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is this acetyl group which are the carbons that were derived from our food, connected to a coenzyme A molecule. Without vitamin B5, there's no coenzyme A, and essentially things like the Krebs cycle stop happening, which means your body can't really produce energy from any food source uh, that your body takes in. It's also important for the synthesis of things like cholesterol and various neurotransmitters. So pantothenic acid is an extremely important vitamin. The good news is this, vitamin B5 deficiency is almost never observed. And the reason why is pantothenic acid, vitamin B5, is found in pretty much anything. Um, it involves the Greek word pan in the name, pantothenic, um, which actually means almost universal or everywhere. So pantothenic acid is found in pretty much all of our food sources. So it's really not that hard to get a sufficient amount of vitamin B5 in your diet on a regular basis. How much do you actually need? Well, as a child, it's somewhere between two and four milligrams per day, varying with age. As an adult, it's five milligrams per day, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, that's how much we'd like you to get on a daily basis. Again, not that hard to meet those requirements by simply eating pretty much any food um, in sufficient abundance, you're gonna get enough vitamin B5 in order to survive. Biotin is another very important molecule that's involved in metabolism as are all of the B vitamins. So uh, biotin is, is an important cofactor for enzymes in the Krebs cycle, um, also known as the citric acid cycle. Um, this is very important because without biotin, most of, again, like we saw with vitamin B5, uh, metabolism just sort of stops at that point uh, if you don't have enough biotin around. Um, so uh, the good news is this, getting insufficient amounts of biotin isn't 
isn't very likely. Um, you can acquire biotin from pretty much any meat or fish product, um, as well as nuts, seeds, and other grains. So biotin is pretty readily available. Um, how much do you need to get on a daily basis? Well, through childhood, it's somewhere between 8 and 20 micrograms per day. As an adult, it's between 25 and 30 micrograms per day uh, in terms of what you should be getting in your diet on a daily basis. Vitamin B6, also known as pyridoxin, uh, is important for a host of different uh, processes in your body. It's important for the transfer of nitrogen groups between amino acids. It's important for the production of hemoglobin. It's important for the activation of, uh, of glycogen in order to convert glycogen into glucose molecules, also known as glycogenolysis or glycogenolysis. Um, so all of these processes require vitamin B6 in order to function. So as you would expect, deficiencies in vitamin B6 can lead to a host of problems. Uh, one of them is anemia, um, and this is due to the inability to produce a sufficient amount of hemoglobin uh, to, for your red blood cells to transport gases throughout your body. You might also notice fatigue, shortness of breath, um, and again, this is all tied to the fact that metabolism is impaired in the absence of vitamin B6. So where are you getting your vitamin B6 from and how much do you need? Well, you need somewhere between 0.5 and 1 milligram of B6 per day if you're a childhood, depending on age. And as an adult, it's 1.3 milligrams per day. Where are you getting it from? Well, you can get it from a variety of meat and fish, so animal sources like that, but also from starchy fruits and vegetables. So things like bananas, potatoes, and chickpeas are loaded full of vitamin B6. The next B vitamin we'll talk about is folate. So folate is evolved in a host of processes, uh, ranging from hemoglobin formation to the ability of your body to produce um, RNA and DNA. Uh, so folate's obviously a very important, um, important vitamin for you to get on a regular basis. Folate actually comes in inactivated and activated forms. Typically when you get it from your food, it's in an inactivated form, but it requires another B vitamin known as cobalamin in order to actually be converted into its active form. You may also absorb it from your diet in the form of folic acid, which is an activated form and does not require um, activation uh, in order to be able to function in your body. Now folic, uh, folate or folic acid deficiency can be highly problematic for, for several reasons. Uh, in adults, an insufficient amount of folate can trigger a certain form of anemia. Uh, and this anemia is due to the inability of the cell of the body to produce a sufficient amount of hemoglobin to help to transport gases throughout the body. During pregnancy, there's also another problem. So as I said before, folate is important for the synthesis of DNA and RNA. This is particularly problematic um, for individuals uh, particularly in cell types uh, that are rapidly dividing. In humans, red blood cells are constantly being produced, hence the interference with the uh, red blood cell production and anemia. But in a developing newborn in a fetus, all cells are going through rapid cell division, which is why getting a proper amount of folate when you're pregnant is hugely important. So what happens in the absence of folate? Well, it turns out that the, the most profound symptoms of folate deficiency in a pregnant woman actually impact the nervous system of the developing fetus. And one of the things that's very common um, in folate deficient women is the develop, uh, development of neural tube disorders. Um, one of the most uh, prominent of these is known as spina bifida. And spina bifida occurs uh, when the spinal, when the spine doesn't fully enclose this, uh, it doesn't fully include enclose the spinal cord so the spinal cord can actually protrude out from the back of the infant and this can lead to a whole host of problems um, ranging from mental deficiencies to uh, um, to uh, to physical impairments uh, as a result of this um, one thing that happened in 1996 was uh, there was um, new standards put in place where uh, many cereals and grain products began to be enriched with folate and one of the interesting impacts of this is the occurrence of, of spina bifida dropped dramatically in the United States since 1996, probably as a result of this increase in folate availability in food sources. So where can you get your folate from? Well, you can get it from a variety of animal sources, meat, poultry, eggs, things like that. You can also get it from dark leafy vegetables, um, which, which is also provide a very good source of, of folate. But now you can get it from fortified foods. So uh, cereals, grains, uh, flowers, things like that have now been fortified with folate to help increase the bioavailability or the availability of this uh, in your diet. So one thing about folate is that your body's ability to utilize and activate folate is dependent on the source. 
Um, not unlike we saw with vitamin A, when we talk about how much vitamin, uh, how much folate you need in your diet, it goes by something called a dietary folate equivalent or a DFE. In childhood, you need somewhere between 150 and uh, 300 uh, micrograms DFE per day. Uh, as an adult, 400 is sufficient, but if you're pregnant, we up that actually to 600 micrograms DFE in order to get a sufficient amount of folate in your diet. The last B vitamin we'll talk about is known as cobalamin or vitamin B12. Uh, so vitamin B12 is important for the synthesis of numerous biological molecules. Uh, one of those is actually hemoglobin. Uh, the main reason why is because as we described before, um, in order for folate to function properly in the hemoglobin biosynthesis pathway, um, vitamin B12 has to be present. So, um, you know, that's one of the major reasons why vitamin B12 deficiency shares so many symptoms. Um, with uh, folate deficiencies because of that overlap. So consequently, um, women who are pregnant need to make sure they get a sufficient amount of vitamin B12 in their diet uh, because without that, you still see that in increased incidence of uh, things like spina bifida and other neural tube disorders. The interesting thing about vitamin B12 is it actually requires the production by your stomach of something called intrinsic factor in order to be absorbed. And if you don't get enough intrinsic factor, your body doesn't absorb vitamin B12 very well. Um, we see this commonly in people that have defects in their digestive organs. So um, this could have to do with an autoimmune syndrome. Um, this happens uh, um, more commonly in elderly individuals because simply body, bodily systems just start to erode uh, as you get older, but it can also be common in people that have gastric ulcers. Uh, all of these can impair the stomach's ability to produce intrinsic factor, um, which make it harder for your body to absorb B12. Um, this could lead to something called pernicious anemia, uh, which you may have heard of. This is going to be a form of anemia uh, that is a result of vitamin B12 deficiency. So how do we treat it? Well, typically we can just give people mega doses of, of B12 supplements to overcome this. Um, if their body's having a hard time absorbing it um, you know, through their gastrointestinal tract, you can actually do it sublingually. And if that doesn't work, um, you can actually just inject people with vitamin B12 to fight off the pernicious anemia. Where are you going to get your vitamin B12 from? A lot of animal sources. So uh, animal products, eggs, uh, poultry, milk, that type of stuff are going to be pretty high in vitamin B12, um, making it fairly readily available. And how much do you need to get? Somewhere between 0 0.9 and 1.8 micrograms per day throughout your childhood, again, in an age-dependent fashion. And as adults, around 2.4 micrograms per day is a sufficient amount of vitamin B12 to maintain normal bodily processes. So the last thing we'll talk about is something known as choline. So choline isn't technically a vitamin because it can be biosynthesized by your body. But your body doesn't typically produce a sufficient amount of choline on its own. So it becomes an essential water-soluble nutrient that you must acquire to get the full amount of choline that you need. Choline is important for numerous processes in your body. For example, it's important for the biosynthesis of an important neurotransmitter known as acetylcholine. It's also important for the production of uh, phospholipids and the transport of lipids throughout your body, as well as the production of certain amino acids. Acquiring enough choline in your diet is important because choline deficiency can have a host of problems. Um, there can be developmental issues if choline deficiency is present while a woman is pregnant. Uh, with respect to the fetus, it can also lead to fatty liver and muscle deterioration um, in adults that suffer from, from choline deficiency. Choline is readily available in many animal-derived products, meat, things like that. It's exceedingly high in liver, for example. Um, and you can acquire most of what you need just by simply eating animal products as a regular part of your diet. Children are going to need somewhere between 150 and 375 milligrams per day, again, varying with age. On the other hand, adults are going to need somewhere between 425 and 550, um, with women needing uh, slightly less than men uh, on that scale on a daily basis in order to meet their, their dietary needs for choline. So today we talked all about vitamins. Um, we talked about the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K, the water soluble vitamins, uh, vitamin C, as well as lots of different B vitamins. And we learned why they're important for our body. Now remember, just because these are micronutrients and not needed in the sheer abundance that the majority of the macronutrients are needed, they're still required. And as you can see, many of these vitamins are required for the bioenergetic processing of the macronutrients. This is why it's so important to acquire a sufficient amount of these on a regular basis. And as you learned today, uh, deficiencies in many of these vitamins can cause a host of problems, some of which can even be fatal. 
Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot and I hope to see you at another one of my videos real soon. Bye. Thank you.